We're here today to talk about George Washington, a man of character. George Washington's impact on American history, heritage, and culture were enormous. And virtually any honest history of George Washington must include the facts of his life, the respect and admiration of both friend and foe, the absolute virtue of his personal life, the remarkable consistency of his conduct, the deep faith that he exhibited, and the enduring example of his leadership. Sadly, much of the example of our first president, and in my opinion, our greatest leader, has been lost slowly in an erosion of our educational systems, increasing attacks on our nation's heritage and history, and the ignorance of our people. If you will make a study of the man, his life and his actions, and his personal character, you will come away with an amazing picture of a man. A man who is truly and literally larger than life, not only in his performance and accomplishments, but in his faith and in his personal testimony. He was a man who was, in the view of his countrymen for many generations, first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. George Washington, the man, was a servant as well as a leader, landowner, commander, and other things. His entire life was a life of service, and his history was marked by his service to others. In service to his family, as a child, he served his parents diligently. The stories of his hard-working and good-natured childhood are plentiful. Even men of faith who served to educate young George went away positively impressed with his good nature, his observant and keen mind, and his tender heart. George also served faithfully and diligently his beloved wife and adopted children. In service to his community, George was a valued mentor and a good neighbor and faithful friend. To many others, a large number of whom we revere today as heroes, it is well said that a man can be judged by his friends, and his were many and wonderful. Books like The Making of George Washington, now out of print, illustrate the details of the forging of his character. In his service to Virginia, Washington was an exemplary citizen, a courageous soldier, observant explorer, and an accurate surveyor as well as a masterful and courageous leader. Many of the surveys that he did still exist and the markers are still accurate in the surveying of lands in the Virginia area. In his service to liberty, George had no equal as a patriot, a sage political philosopher, and finally as a victorious commander against the most powerful military on earth at that time, when it came to a time of war. But especially in service to his nation, Washington shone forth as a great and wise leader, a model president, and a worldwide example of what American leadership and the American dream were really all about. Washington also lived a life of exemplary faith in conduct, business, politics, and great conflict, and as a leader. In a well-known farewell address, he told his people, the name of American, which belongs to you in your national capacity, must always exalt the just pride of patriotism more than any appellation derived from local discriminations. With slight shades of differences, you all have the same religion. And later in that same document, he reminded them that reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. He brought faith and a godly example to his family. Both devout and diligent, he pursued godly conduct in his home and his life in every area. His business was conducted in complete transparency and honesty. His prayers for the success of his crops and others, and for his family and friends, the kind treatment of buyers, sellers, managers, and workers, and the concise delivery of product and payment were legendary among fellow landowners and residents of his area. His conduct in elected and appointed office throughout his life earned nothing but the highest respect and deference from his fellows, his superiors, those he led, and even his opponents. During the war, his conduct as a leader was praised by friend and foe, and his treatment of a vanquished enemy was unparalleled in our history. In his service to our nation as our first president, he earned the respect and admiration of a nation through his policies and actions, even though sometimes opposed his opponents rarely questioned his motives or his methods, as his character was impeccable. 
During his inauguration, Washington took the oath as prescribed by the Constitution, but added several religious components to that official ceremony. How many of you know that these items had the genesis in George Washington's inauguration? Before taking the oath of office, he summoned a Bible on which to take the oath, added the words, so help me God, to the end of the oath, and then leaned over and kissed the Bible. As time passed after Washington's first great battle at Monongahela early in his life, several facts surfaced about which we can understand a little more of the extent to which God directly intervened in behalf of Washington. For example, a famous Indian warrior who was a leader in that battle was often heard to publicly testify that Washington, quote, was never born to be killed by a bullet. I had 17 fair fires at him with my rifle, and after all, could not bring him to the ground. Now, when one considers that a rifle aimed by an experienced marksman rarely misses its target, his utterance seems to have been prophetic, and it's evident that an invisible hand turned aside the bullets. Washington, from his boyhood to his death, was revered as the hero of that battle. And one day, while traveling toward the Western territories to explore uninhabited regions, while near the junction of the great Kanawha and Ohio rivers, a company of Indians, led by an old respected chief, came to see him. A fire was kindled, and the chief spoke to Washington through an interpreter. He explained that when he heard Washington was coming to that part of the country, he set out on a long journey to meet Washington personally and speak to him about the battle 15 years earlier. Through this interpreter, he said, I am chief and ruler over my tribes. My influence extends to the waters of the Great Lakes and the far Blue Mountains. I've traveled a long and weary path that I might see the young warrior of the great battle. It was on the day when the white man's blood mixed with the streams of our forest that I first beheld this chief, Washington. I called to my young men and said, Mark, young, tall and daring warrior. He is not of the Redcoat tribe. He hath an Indian's wisdom, and his warriors fight as we do. Himself is alone exposed. Quick, let your aim be certain, and he dies. Our rifles were leveled, rifles which but for you knew not how to miss. T'was all in vain. A power mightier far than we shielded you. Seeing that you were under the special guardianship of the Great Spirit, we immediately ceased to fire at you. I am old and soon shall be gathered to the great council fire of my fathers in the land of shades. But ere I go, there is something bids me speak in the voice of prophecy. Listen, the great spirit protects that man, he said, pointing at Washington, and guides his destinies. He will become the chief of nations, and a people yet unborn will hail him as the founder of a mighty empire. I am come to pay homage to the man who is the particular favorite of heaven and who can never die in battle. Many years later, 80 years in fact, a gold seal borne by Washington in the battle containing his initials was found on the battlefield. It had been shot off of him by a bullet. That relic is now in possession of the family. True to the Indian's voice of prophecy, Washington never was wounded in a battle. So remarkable was his escape from the numerous perils to which he was exposed during battle that mention was made by many famous preachers of the day. Reverend Samuel Davies, who later became president of Princeton University, after concluding that Washington was a military genius, added, I may point out to the public that heroic youth, Colonel Washington, whom I cannot but hope Providence has hitherto preserved in so signal a manner for some important service to his country. How accurately that wish was fulfilled by Washington's life. Because of God's help and divine intervention, Washington gathered acclaim and honor from the very same field where his commander received only dishonor and ultimately death. George Washington exhibited notable command of manners and civility throughout his entire life. His attention and diligence in social matters and the attention he gave to the sensibilities and concerns of others were complete. At the age of just 14, a time when most of us struggle to get our children today to simply be civil at all, he penned 110 rules of civility and decent behavior in company and conversation. A list of do's and don'ts for conversation 
and dealings with others. It's remarkable. The Northwest Ordinance was the first federal law to address education, and it was penned in, in part by George Washington and certainly was signed and authorized by Washington. And the same founding fathers who drafted the First Amendment, the amendment that courts now interpret as prohibiting the presence of religious activities in public education, stated in Article 3, signed by George Washington, Religion, morality, and knowledge being necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind, schools and the means of education shall forever be encouraged. He also felt that our students and our citizens should be educated in the understanding of our republic, our constitution, our form of government. He stated, a primary object should be the education of our youth in the science of government. In a republic, what species of knowledge can be equally important and what duty more pressing on its legislature than to patronize a plan for communicating it to those who are to be the future guardians of the liberties of the country? This is a statement taken directly from the 8th State of the Union Address of our first president, George Washington. From that final farewell address, George Washington stated, the acceptance of and continuance hitherto in the office to which your suffrages have twice called me have been a uniform sacrifice of inclination to the opinion of duty and to a deference for what appeared to be your desire. I constantly hoped that it would have been much earlier in my power, consistently with motives which I was not at liberty to disregard, to return to that retirement from which I had been reluctantly drawn. How many presidents at the end of two terms in office have said that they longed to return to private life, did not seek the office, and served out of duty to the people who had called them? A uniform sacrifice of inclination to the opinion of duty. In this book, written by Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge, there's a statement about our president, George Washington. It's stated here by brilliant historian Richard Green, no nobler figure ever stood in the forefront of a nation's life. It cannot be said more concisely, and it's certainly accurate. Truly, George Washington was the father of our nation. He should be revered. He should be honored. And he should be recognized for the great leader that he was and the great example that he is to all leaders in America to this very day. Let's celebrate George Washington's birthday with a remembrance of what he gave us and the sacrifices he made to America. Thank you.